This program is made possible in part by support from Seben Carey, Minnesota's original personal injury law firm. Seben Carey. Visit us online at knowyourrights.com. Hello and welcome. The name David Rowe is synonymous in our state and in the country with the labor movement. And David is with me tonight to talk about his life, about the AFL-CIO in Minnesota, about some of his wonderful experiences with some of our most famous Minnesota leaders. And he just had a birthday and so we're kind of celebrating. Yes, thank you. Yeah, right. November thirtieth, you November turned 30th, yeah. ninety. Ninety years old. So you're doing wonderfully, Dave. Well, thank you. If I knew, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> Who said that? That's got to be a I, great, I don't know. <laughs> a great line that's carried forward, huh? Well, you were born in Lawton. I just Lawton, heard. Lawton, North Dakota, which is north of Grand north Forks. North of uh, Grand Forks, and. Uh, uh, my father was in the grain uh, business. There was a lot of Norwegians and Swedes in that area because that's where Scandinavians uh, uh, migrated. Migrated, right? And uh, I was born in 1924. Uh, 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 1929 came and with the, with the uh, the big crash. My right. father was in the grain business, and we moved to uh, uh, Minneapolis, and uh, went to Minneapolis public. Uh, 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 schools. Roosevelt went first, to Roosevelt. Right? To Roosevelt, uh, and then uh, west. And then uh, my folks moved, and I, uh, rather than change, uh, rather than stay there, I moved with my folks, and I went to West High School, and I was there until uh, I went in the service in 1942. Quit school in 1942 to join the Navy. I wanted to do my uh, 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 my part, mm -hmm. and I came back in 1946, and I needed a high school uh, diploma, so I went back to school at West High School for about two months, got that, and then I moved on. And you got married in there somewhere, too? Uh, 1946. To 1946. Your wife yet? Oh, I, I, Audrey, I, 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 right? such a beautiful woman, and, and it wouldn't been for her and her dedication to, to me. I wouldn't have had the time to do all of the things she gave me three lovely daughters. Oh, they're, and, and they're just so, mm. they're so great. I have 10 uh, grandchildren and 18 great grandchildren. And I have a great granddaughter in uh, Fairmont, and I'm working on her because I want to have a great, great oh, before wow. I leave. Wow. So the row name continues on, yes. doesn't it? Um, when you think back to those early days, you started out when you and Audrey were just a young, young couple working on the railroad, you told me, and getting up at three in the morning, and it sounds like a horrendous hard job. Well, we come right out of the uh, service and, and uh, went to work <laughs> for the Railway uh, uh, Express. I worked there, I, I joined my first uh, union, uh, Railroad Brotherhoods, the local 1324. Uh, uh, and we had a little apartment and twenty-three dollars a month, and I saved up enough money. Twenty-three a month that twenty-three dollars a month. And she had to do some to work in, in, the, in the apartment to to offset some of uh, that. Finally, got enough money to purchase a house, uh, thirty-seven, thirty-two Second Avenue South, which is now part of the thirty-five uh, freeway, and uh, we paid nine thousand dollars for the house. And in those days, because of price controls, we had to buy the Carpeting separate. We had to buy the uh, 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 drapes uh, separate. That was really something. That was price controls. But we uh, we survived and did well, and, and we started to raise a uh, a family. And and uh, 
here we are today with you. It was your landlord, Dave, that got you into the union world, wasn't it? It, it really, uh, it really was. In fact, is during the uh, uh, early parts of the uh, of the war when I was gone, my wife did some babysitting for his children, mm -hmm. and then he saw in the newspaper that we were going to get married, and he says, "I have a place for you if you would like it." And it was twenty-three dollars a month. That was a week. We could handle uh, that. She still had to do some work in cleaning halls and this type of uh, of thing. But uh, that's how I got my uh, start. He brought me into his, to the uh, to the local, the Lathers. Uh, and a lather is someone who prepares, who prepares before the plaster. For the plaster. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In those days, uh, just about every house that was uh, built during the uh, during our uh, that era in oh. this particular uh, uh, arena, uh, it was all lath and, and uh, uh, plaster. So I spent uh, till 1949, I got, a, uh, I got uh, an apprenticeship and I graduated and became a, uh, a journeyman. I became an officer of my local in 1951. I became the business manager of my uh, local union, 190. You just rose very quickly through the ranks, as they say, didn't well, you? Well, yeah. After I had that, I uh, uh, progressed and, and uh, be became active. I became an officer, or in fact, is the president of the uh, State Building Trades uh, uh, Council. And I was there for about 10 years. And then I, uh, I moved up and became a vice president of the central body and a vice president of the state AFL-CIO. And in 1966, I became the uh, president of the state AFL-CIO. Uh, and you had that job until the end of 84, correct? 1984. So that was a long tenure, wasn't yeah, it? And I had 10 years as the vice president prior to that. So between the vice president and Princey, about 29 uh, years, in fact, is I think I've spent my uh, entire adult life in the uh, uh, labor movement. The labor movement has been very, very good to me, and, and I've tried to uh, repay it by doing whatever I thought was necessary to, uh, to say thank you and, 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 and repay them for their courtesies and electing me a, a, an officer of the various unions. I want to jump and ask you a very big question. Um, we have to go so fast with the uh, 28 minute interview, Dave, but when you think of your years, 66 to 84, as president and then earlier vice president, what was the biggest challenge during that period for you as a labor leader? Well, there were probably uh, 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 several. Uh, one was the uh, 1972, when uh, the government McGovern, was running yeah. for uh, uh, president, uh, we had uh, a directive from the AFL-CIO from George Meany that there would be no endorsement mm -hmm. for, for him. And it came time for the uh, convention, and a resolution came in to the, uh, to, to the convention, and a thousand delegates sitting there, and it went before the committee, and the committee said we're going to uh, Come in with a recommendation for endorsement for uh, uh, for McGovern, and I says, "No, you're not. You go back and reconsider that uh, uh, resolution. We're not going to do anything that's going to destroy this uh, uh, this federation on a uh, uh, issue that George Meany says we ought not get into." Uh, and, and you were basing that on the the. Um what happened to another state when they went against the national? Well, Colorado. Colorado, Colorado did it, and they removed mm -hmm. all of the officers. Well, that didn't concern me, and mm. and I told the I told the delegates that doesn't concern me here either. Mm. But I said we're not going to we're not going to to uh, uh, oppose a directive from George uh, 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 Meany, the president of the state AFL. Uh, I mean, from the national AFL CIO. So you go back and redraft it. And they said they didn't want to. I said, you go back and redraft it. So I went before the committee and I said, you bring in a resolution that we're going to do everything we possibly can to defeat Richard Nixon as president of the United States. And we brought that in. 
and uh, I couldn't tell you if it was 50-50, 60-40. Uh, when it came for the, uh, it was just uh, for a the voice, vote. voice uh, vote. Pardon? Just a voice vote. Just a voice mm -hmm. vote, and uh, I said, "Well, it, uh, the resolution passed. Do everything we can to defeat Richard uh, uh, Nixon." There were shouts of roll call votes and everything else, and I says, uh, "We've we've finished this. We now we'll move on to the next order of uh, uh, business." And we did the same thing, I think, with a. Young, uh, young trade unionists from the, I think, from the office employees, who brought a resolution in on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on abortion, and uh, I said, this is not a labor uh, uh, issue, and when they brought the resolution to me, I took it and I put it in my, uh, my envelope or my under my book. The young woman gets up and says, I don't see my resolution here. I says, it's right here. And I says, no, let, let me just ask you this to the delegates. If this resolution was to come before the, uh, uh, the convention, how many would support it? And Jesus, hands went up all over. How many would oppose it? Hands went up all over. I said, well, it seems to me that the AFL-CIO in Minnesota is, is uh, split, half for it, half against it. Bang, that, that, that the resolution now will go back into my folder. We'll go on to the next order of... Uh, of uh, 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 business. So you were a very strong leader. You took things kind of into your own hands. I had times. the gavel. You had the gavel, right? I had the gavel. Did you get a lot of criticism for that style, or oh, were you supported? Yeah. I know this was. I, I didn't. I don't think I got criticized for those for that uh, that style. I may have been criticized for. Uh, some of the actions that were taken that, uh, you know, that my mm -hmm. gavel uh, 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 said we should, uh, uh, we should do, but we went on. And uh, the AFL-CIO in Minnesota was strong then, and the Minnesota AFL-CIO is strong today. And I think I read somewhere that it was maybe at its peak back in those days, right around that period, wasn't it? I think, in terms I think of all over the country, the, the, the labor movement <laughs> was, uh, 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 was there. One of the things that really set us down was in 1981 when Reagan was, was, the, uh, 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 was the president. Uh, the air controllers uh, mm -hmm. were concerned about their uh, working conditions. Uh, you know, they're watching those blips. They didn't have enough folks really to relieve themselves of when they had to take a break or what have you, and, and breaks were far between. Uh, they endorsed uh, uh, Reagan. And Reagan said that he would, uh, he would uh, assist them in making the changes. He became elected, and uh, his response was to fire the, uh, the air controllers. I, I, I contacted all of the board members of the AFL-CIO and got them to agree that we would ask the, the president, Amini, to call a nationwide strike. Mm -hmm. And Amini said, no. Absolutely not. Maybe he was just a little upset because of the air controller's uh, support for, uh, uh, for Reagan. But, uh, so that was kind of a low point in the history of our, our country and unions. And yes, this, Europe, this, was, this was down. And, 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 yeah. and, and the word went out that uh, the employers of this, uh, this country had a friend in the White House, Ronald, uh, 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 Ronald Reagan. And uh, we've, had difficulty. we've had difficulty, uh, I think, even today, that uh, some were feel, still feeling some of those effects of what happened in 1981. Jim Oberstar, bless him, uh, who was uh, 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 active in, 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 in Congress, spent two or three trips down from Duluth to uh, uh, Farmington. Uh, to speak to the air controllers mm -hmm. and said that he had mm -hmm. his support. Jim Overstar was just a great man. We've, we've been blessed with great politicians in this state from uh, vice presidents to senators to governors to uh, and leaders. And you've known them all, haven't you? I want to, yes, this yeah. is a great segue, Dave, for all me. Right. All right. I want to ask you about some of your associations with some of our leaders. As I mentioned in the uh, intro, you told me a fascinating story a couple of days ago 
about being invited by Hubert Humphrey to go with him to Vietnam. And you tell uh, what happened with Westmoreland and 1968. Well, we, I made that uh, I made that trip with uh, him to uh, with Humphrey uh, to Vietnam, and we, the reason for the trip was the inauguration of Chu and Key as president and vice president of uh, of uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, before we left, uh, I had a chance to meet with Westmoreland. We had an old DC-3, and, and I flew with him. We sat together, and he talked about what was going to happen with uh, Vietnam when we left, it was, you know, for tourists, what have you. Mm -hmm. He said it could be a very positive uh, uh, thing. He was just a great, uh, he was a great man. And uh, Humphrey told us that he had a, a uh, not a firm commitment, but he had a commitment from, from Chu, the, the new president of uh, Vietnam, that he would go to Paris for the peace talks. And uh, Nixon, uh, of course, got a hold of Chu and says, hey, you can do better with me than you can with, uh, with him. Nixon was uh, uh, elected uh, uh, president. And uh, back in that, in that helicopter that you were in with, with Humphrey and Westmoreland, yes. did Westmoreland express any personal feelings about being war weary? Did he talk at all about his sense of how things were going and had gone? Because he was head of the U.S. military. Yes, he was. The whole effort there for years. Yeah, we talked a lot about the, uh, uh, the war. One of the things that I asked about, and I think some of the folks here did, is why don't we carry, the, why don't we carry this fight to North Vietnam? Well, he had a, an explanation for that that seemed to make uh, sense at that, uh, 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 at that time. And, uh, but the experience with, with uh, Westmoreland and uh, Humphrey, and uh, you know, if I may say, say this, I, I met a, a old Asian, his name was Bu, B-U-U, who was the president of the Asian Confederation of, 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 of Labor. And we talked about a number of things. And he says, you know, your, your country is a little bit wrong. He says, building a country and for, forming one and supporting one is like building a house. You have to have a foundation. foundation. You have to have, in this case, you have to have the people. But he says, your country, uh, you go for leaders. You go for Batista and the Shah of Iran and the rest mm -hmm. of forgetting the people. And I, I think that uh, it made comment. a lot of uh, it made a lot of uh, uh, made a lot of sense, and still makes a lot of sense to me today. Just back to Humphrey for a minute, Dave. What was it about him that you admired? I know he was someone you tremendously liked, and what one quality of his kind of stood out? His compassion. Hmm. His compassion. He had compassion for, 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 for not the folks in Minnesota that he was elected to, but for all of those, for minorities, for uh, anybody who worked. He was just a great, great, uh, uh, just a great, great, uh, uh, great person. Uh, uh, this country I missed him being, being president, mm -hmm. and I miss him. Oh, myself now, and in fact, there's you know a little, little side story that uh, that uh, he he come to our convention and and he uh, spoke in 1977, and that's when he made that famous remark that a fellow who has no tears has no uh, has no uh, uh, heart. has no heart. Mm -hmm. uh, just brought the uh, brought it uh, now and, and, and as the statue quote, said, isn't it? as the statue said in. And where he is now in, in, the, uh, in the Capitol grounds that uh, to the folks in the South that it's about time we come out of the, to the uh, shadows of states' rights into the sunlight of human rights. And that's how he did. He, he, he another was great, a great, <laughs> he was great just man. such and, a speaker, and I think, wasn't and he? And I think of, and I mentioned earlier with respect to my uh, wife, bless her, he was dying after the convention, and he... Uh, he called you, didn't he? He called, he called me and uh, said, uh, David, I want to thank you. And I said, 
Humphrey, you don't have to thank me. You, you, you. We, thank, uh, we thank you. And we had chatted just a couple of minutes. And I said, you've got so many, many f folks to, to, to talk to. Uh, you, better, you better do it. He says, no, not till I talk to Audrey. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, a, what a great thing mm -hmm. he wouldn't do. And Such a human gesture, human. wasn't just it? A great, yeah. Just a great Wonderful. gesture. And at 6 o'clock that next morning, my Skip called and said his father was dead. So you were one of the last to get to last have to a talk good talk with him, weren't you? Real quickly, we don't have a lot of time left. Walter Mondale invited you to go with him when he was vice president down to Panama. Tell us just a, a summary story about that trip. Well, that was, a great, uh, that was a great trip. One of the nice things about that trip, we flew over there in Air Force uh, One, and we didn't sit in those cramped seats. <laughs> We sat in big Davenports. But anyway, we went there, and, and uh, uh, he was speaking to a, a group, most of them from, you know, from the uh, uh, Americas down there that really went friendly to, uh, to us. And uh, were very, very discourteous to uh, Mondale when he was uh, uh, speaking to, uh, uh, to them during the, the uh, commemoration of, of the, the change from the Panama to, from the U.S. to to, uh, uh, to them, and every American ought to be proud. He stood right up there and he just looked him right in the eye and and, and made his uh, uh, speech. Uh, the next morning they took down our flag and put up the Panamanian, and I feel bad today because uh, we didn't go with him. We couldn't we couldn't do that. He had to go because he was the he was the vice uh, 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 president. Would have been a great, great, uh, uh, great president. I, uh, I've been blessed, I think, with 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 a, with a, with, a, with a family, with a wife and kids. You've had such an oh. amazing life. Um, Governor Ventura pretty much killed the Labor Interpretive Center that you were really, really hoping to bring to fruition here in I, Minnesota. I worked on that. I worked on that project for a number of, of years finally got it uh, uh, passed in the in the uh, in the legislature the legislature gave us uh, the old science museum mm -hmm. gave us six million dollars to to renovate it it was looking and, good uh, at that point pardon it was looking good at that point wasn't well, it? everything was fine until it got to the governor's desk and he vetoed it and uh, I still have the copy of, of the uh, television program from Chris Matthews from Hardball oh. when, when he asked uh, the governor, what was, the, what was your greatest accomplishment as governor in your first year? He says, was stopping a labor museum from being built in, in Minnesota. He's not my most popular politician. I bet uh, you were so disappointed. But you turned around and worked like crazy and got the Workers' Memorial Garden yes. to become a reality. And you've got to be proud of that. I oh. mean, it's not what you had planned, but no. it's something it done. Something it's, taken me, it's taken me over 15 years of my own, my retired time to continue to work and work and work to for that. This. Uh, we finally got a, one phase of it, uh, uh, one phase of it uh, done. And it's on uh, the Capitol grounds. Uh, oh, on the Capitol grounds right. in the front. And, 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 and uh, Mondale, who was there uh, at the, our, one of our first openings, uh, indicated that these grounds are, are sacred. Mm -hmm. These grounds are sacred. And, and I never forget uh, that. And you stop and think of what, what the state has done, the Capitol Area uh, Planning Board, and putting for, for women, for Mondale, or I mean for, for Humphrey, for uh, uh, I don't know how many other folks, World War II, uh, And we Korean can go War. see that. It's right, right on the Capitol grounds. Right on the Capitol grounds. We're going grounds. to insert a couple of photos so people will at least yes. get a peek at it, and then you've got to go over there and see it. Um, what do you think is your greatest legacy? We've just got a minute left, Dave, but what would you say you feel proudest about that is a result of your personal efforts? 
Well, they're kind of a joint effort. I have to include my wife in, in, in this because if it wasn't for her, I couldn't have done these, these things. But uh, and the labor movement uh, uh, opened up a whole new area for, for, uh, for me. I met, I don't know how many different uh, kinds of uh, uh, folks, uh, real folks. I represented, I think, one of the greatest organizations in the, uh, in the state, the Minnesota AFL-CIO, and uh, I, I'm just extremely proud to have done uh, uh, that. God's been good to me. Uh, the state has been good to, uh, uh, to me. Uh, so just, just kind of an overall sense of you had a purposeful life and have continued all these years with this sense of purpose, and that's got to be a very rewarding feeling. You're not looking back with regrets, it sounds oh, like. Not, not, a, not at uh, all, are you? Not a thing. I, uh -huh. I look forward to it, and I'm very, very pleased, and I, I'm, I'm glad that the state AFL-CIO is in good shape. All of our unions are in good shape. The national AFL-CIO is in good shape. And where does, the greatest job anybody can have is to working with and for people. Well, I can see getting to visit with you now and earlier, why you were such a successful leader. I mean, your brains, your, your bravery, your uh, ability to just speak out. Thank you so much, Dave, for thank coming you. down. And uh, it's been wonderful to get to, thank you. to thank know you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and hear some of your wonderful stories. Well, bless you. Wish we had more time. Thank you for being with us. If you tuned in late, I've been talking with David Rowe, who is President Emeritus of the AFL-CIO of Minnesota, 1966 to 84, and before and after that too, just a real Mr. Labor of Minnesota. I'll see you next week, bye-bye.